<laughs> Jimmy, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. For our audience, Jimmy Zhao is a fellow MBA student here at Harvard Business School, but the first、uh, second year student in EC、uh, on the podcast. In addition, Jimmy has had a stellar career in finance during the day, but we're also depends equally on metric. depends on the metric. But the,、uh, we're here also equally to have a great conversation and learn a little bit more about your、uh, part-time hustle as a power competitive powerlifter、uh, and how you've really managed to balance the two. So we、we'll、just dive right in. For yourself, what has been really harder? For you, on your mind, on your body, you think a career in finance as a trader or competitive powerlifting? That's a that's a pretty good question. Yeah, so I guess maybe I'll just explain my background a little bit. Yeah.、Um, yeah. I actually, I studied chemistry in, in college.、Um, I remember, I remember growing up and thinking I want to go into banking, investment banking, finance. So. I did two summers in、uh, IBD M and A.、Uh, in the UK, it is pretty normal to do chemistry and then go into M and A. And you grew up in, in London. London. Yeah, I grew up in London. Hence the lovely accent. Yeah, hence the accent.、Uh, and then、uh, at some point in my senior year, I'd, I'd signed a full time contract to、uh, go into IBD, and、um, I was,、uh, and I was interviewing for some、uh, high frequency trading firms、uh, in Europe, and then I found out. Um, it was it was much better paid,、uh, and it was way more exciting. So I actually I actually decided to take a job in、uh, in high frequency trading.、Um, so I、uh, traded derivatives、uh, for six years,、uh, one year in London, five years in Hong Kong.、Um, my last three years were、uh, at Citadel Securities in Hong Kong.、Uh, it's a pretty big firm, I guess.、Uh, well, well known. known. Yeah, I was there during、uh, the GME stuff in 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 the US, and that was pretty exciting.、Um, but what's harder? Well, they're different for sure.、Uh, training for powerlifting, it's, it's a consistency. I've had、uh, I had a I had a long term injury、uh, from the end of college, twenty sixteen to around. Twenty、uh, sixteen to around twenty 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 nineteen end of twenty nineteen twenty twenty, um, had my back so that was uh that was tough that was definitely one of the low points of my life, um lifting wise uh for sure, um so having to bounce back from that probably was toughest part uh much tougher than anything I've done in trading, um yeah but trading is definitely mentally draining. Um, it's it's a it's a tough career, you know.、You've、got to be concentrating、uh, all day when markets are open, and then you、right. do do your research after close.、Um, but yeah, training wise, yeah, it's con it's about consistency.、Uh, two different coaches, and it's just about getting into the gym,、uh, doing the workout, and、uh, making sure you don't miss a workout. That's that's the that's the most important. Absolutely. What what is not missing a workout? How how often every week do you how do you work out every day? Is it like you have rest days? What what's the schedule like? What year are we in? Twenty twenty four. Twenty twenty two. Yeah, end of twenty twenty two. I switch coaches. Um. So I train five times a week. Um. Around two. Every workout probably takes me around two hours. Two out. Two to between two. It can take between one and a half and three hours, depending on how efficient I am.、Uh, so that's five times a week.、Um, what does not missing a workout mean? It means not missing a workout no matter、yep. what. Uh, so uh, even when I'm traveling,、um, yeah, recently I was in Ghana for class.、Uh, yeah, can't miss a workout.、Um, and yeah, I I went around a couple of countries after just to see what they're like. Um, but one of the things I like to do when I travel is check out the gyms.、Uh, I like to train on specific equipment, but when you're traveling, you get used to just training in normal commercial gyms, man. So you just appreciate、uh, the nice equipment when you when you get when you get to a real gym.、Uh, but yeah, recently I went to Togo, Benin,、uh, Cote d'Ivoire, Senegal, and saw the gyms there. They were, they were pretty good. Didn't miss a workout.、Right. Um, but yeah. That 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 is the commitment to not missing a workout. It's training on holiday. 
That is impressive. That is impressive. And especially, yeah, the difficulties of finding consistent gyms or quality gyms, especially traveling. That's tough. Now let's get into a little bit about, I guess, how did you get started, right? You mentioned you injured, you had a back injury and this was 2018, 2016, 2016. 2016. Yeah. And, you know, you have a Instagram, you posted your kind of transformation over, you know, hard work, especially over the last five years. How did you really get into powerlifting or kind of this overall trend of fitness? Um, yeah, that, I mean, this, that's a, that's an interesting story, I guess. Uh, so I guess when I was in high school, I was kind of, I was pretty fat as a kid. Uh, I didn't, I was really, fat too. I didn't, I didn't play any sports. Really. Okay. My main sport was actually bridge. So, uh, I was actually, me and my uh, best friend were competitive bridge players. Um, uh, we were, yeah, we were ranked nationally. Um, we played, uh, England under 19s. Um, that was a, that was a great time. Like the leagues were crazy. We would, uh, we would be playing against like 80 year old women wow. on our week, on our weeknights. That was our, that was our like competitive league that we played in. Uh, That's so we, yeah, so we played bridge for like, yeah, basically, uh, last four years of uh, secondary school in the UK. That's what we call it. And then um, all through college. Uh, so that was my main sport. So I, I was like pretty academic. And then just when I got to uni, um, that's what we call college in the UK, uh, just started training, going to the gym with some friends like uh, in school because you know, we were playing rugby, uh, and stuff and everyone would just hit the gym so started going to the gym second year I remember trying to lose weight but like in a crazy way um, I'll do like 200 squats in the morning wow. uh, eat basically no food I lost weight but I was still like I was still like fat but oh, I was just, I was just, the worst I was just, skinny fat I was just like skinny fat I was getting stronger for sure okay uh, and then uh, at some point the, the thing was, is it was always embarrassing to bench. Okay. It was always embarrassing to bench. All my friends were benching like, it's not like 200 pounds or whatever, one, two, 180, 200, 220. And I was like still on 135, one plate on the bar. So I, we, I didn't really touch the bench for the first year. I was like in the gym with okay. my friend. And then uh, I actually did an exchange year at MIT uh, in my third year. Uh, so I've, I've been in Boston before and uh, basically started committing to the gym then. Um, there was actually a famous powerlifter. Well, now he's still famous, but he was getting pretty big back then. He joined as a freshman, uh, took some inspiration from him uh, and just uh, just had some friends who started going to the gym with me. And then at that point, you know, that was like one of the most consistent things that year. Yeah. Um, studying at MIT was pretty hard but it was good to let loose uh, in the gym uh, also did some cheerleading shout out to MIT cheer that was a great time all right um but yeah so that was that was when I that was when I properly focused on it and then when I got back to Cambridge to do my fourth year my master's year um I basically committed to it like properly stopped going out stopped drinking uh training uh, I had a goal. I had a goal, and the goal was to get. We had these colors, these school colors, full blue in in Cambridge, and you had to hit a certain number as a powerlifter to get uh, full blue. And basically, it's the same as the same like status as you get as representing Cambridge uh, in the in the rugby team versus Oxford in the in the varsity match, which is like one of the most decorated games in college rugby in in the UK. So I thought it was kind of funny that I could join Cambridge as like a fat Asian kid and and get 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 colours um, as a as a powerlifter. Um, so that was my goal for my last year at uni. Um, I missed it by a, a deadlift, but I got half blue, which was like kind of whatever. Um, okay. I I missed my last deadlift at varsity, which kind of gut wrenching. But you know you, you live and you live and learn. We qualified for university world the university world championships, the first one. Uh, so I, uh, in July, 2016, I went to, uh, Belarus, Minsk, Belarus to wow. compete in, uh, the world university championships. That was exciting. That was exciting. But unfortunately during the prep for that, 
I was training like an idiot. Um, I injured my back and didn't take it and didn't take my back very seriously. Continued to push through training. Did not do well in those in the in that competition. Our team actually uh, got a bronze medal, but I I did not do well personally. Mm. Uh, so yeah, so twenty. So that was how I got into it uh, and how I got my injury. Yeah, and yeah, definitely a back injury, and you know, form is everything to make sure that you don't, know, especially, have long term consequences from the impacts of、uh, powerlifting, right? Yeah, yeah, form form was important. Form form warm ups and and making sure you do your accessories. I never did my accessories. Like what's accessories? Like just. Focusing on some of the muscles that you don't normally get worked, and just doing squat bench deadlift, you know.、Um, like I had a weak core, so doing ab ab work, which I hated.、Mm. Um, doing my shoulder shoulder mobility, just working out my I don't know lateral raises, rows, leg extensions, everything. I used to just skip accessories, no more. And also, I used to just jump straight into my workout, the warm up. That was. Terrible. Not a good idea. That was terrible. Yeah, do not do that. That's how I did my back. Okay, well, let's dive into a little bit、uh, into kind of now that you have obviously done this for five years, you've committed. You're an expert. You're in the industry.、Uh, let's for our audience who might be you know into working out and stuff. What are some of the, in your opinion, kind of some critical, most optimal exercises that one needs to do in order to become, you know. Uh, good, or at least proficient at powerlifting, doing the deadlifts, doing the squats, doing the bench. Yeah, so、uh, I mean, that's well. Firstly, form is everything. So, like, my biggest advice to anyone starting out would be: if you actually want to get into powerlifting, or you know, we can go into general lifting weights in a bit. But if you want to. Do powerlifting, which is a very niche sport, growing but very niche.、Mm -hmm. You should hire a coach for sure.、Um, and if you're a beginner, I would just hire. I would hire an in-person coach.、Uh, one of the biggest things that changed my lifting career.、Uh, I'm. I would rank myself as like an intermediate lifter.、Um, and one of the things that biggest things that helped me in my career so far is、uh, finding the right coach.、Um, that. You know, programming right now is so scientific, especially in the US. It used to just be you do four sets of eight Russian Smolov program. You just do four sets of eight, progress it every week, kill yourself by volume, do ton of sets,、mm -hmm. and then just like grow that way. But now there's a lot of research into、um, optimal cycles of training, so like、uh, growing, how much work you should do.、Um, Week by week, how much you should grow your volume week by week, intensity,、okay. recovery, and just getting ready for competition.、Um, that yeah, it's it's pretty complicated now. And yeah, we're in a great spot where the sport is growing. So、um, in the next five years, I think it will actually probably become a mainstream sport.、Um, it's going to the World Games next year. It's 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 growing. So it's cool to see、uh, a lot of young lifters, especially in the US,、mm -hmm. uh, do it. Um, because in the US, like such an emphasis on sports from a young age, but you know, American football,、uh, basketball, etc. When those talents come in, the US is just going to be unstoppable. Absolutely, pretty unstoppable already. They, oh, absolutely. The US are pretty good already, but yeah.、Uh, so as you mentioned, you know the powerlifting. You're you got to do these, and I think for our for audiences, you know there are people who are you know aware at least of working out and competitive. Um, events for it, you know. There's powerlifting, there's weightlifting,、yeah. and there's bodybuilders, yeah, right? Yeah. And, and that's also a big space, you know, from Arnold Schwarzenegger to yeah, Sebum. Yeah. Now, what are the distinctions between these three?、Uh, yeah, so, so yeah, so powerlifting、uh, traditionally, well, not traditionally, but it's it's the most niche, I would think, but it's the easiest to get into.、Mm. Um, It's basically squat, bench, and deadlift. So the squat, if you don't know, you basically have the bar on your back. You squat down,、yeah. and then your legs. You you basically have to squat down and then squat back up. And then the bench is like you lie down on the bench, you hold a barbell in your hands, and then you pull it down to your chest and then push it back up. And then the deadlift is you just pick you just pick up the bar and stand up with it, basically. Super easy, 
you know, so in the basic world, all you need is just a barbell, a rack and a bench. Uh, and you can pretty much train anywhere. And I've trained in some gyms where it, they take that meaning to the, to the max. Um, Olympic weightlifting uh, is what my girlfriend does. Uh, it's a it's a bit more of a complicated sport. It's very technical. Um, basically, the clean and jerk, where you uh, where you pull the bar up to your chest, right. yeah, and then, and then you and then you jerk it up, and then the snatches you bring it up from the floor and then take it directly up above your shoulders. Oh, okay. So that has been. Uh, that's been in the Olympics for some time. Um, the the Chinese are pretty good at that sport, um, and it's been growing in popularity because CrossFit has also implemented a lot of bastardized Olympic weightlifting into the, <laughs> into the sport. Uh, so that's why I actually did ollie lifting during my um, recovery uh, for my back, um, but I kept on dislocating my shoulders. Ooh. So my shoulders would keep falling out. Um, one time I woke up and my shoulder was just like out. So I, at that point, was I the, was, was how was severe was the pain? It was just like out, and I was it was it was it, was, it didn't feel good. Didn't feel good. Um, it didn't feel good. But yeah, my shoulder was just out, and I was like, okay, that, that's about it. I've got to stop uh, okay. doing and, and recovery. Wow. So you have to have really good shoulder mobility. It's also a really technical sport. So uh, you 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 are drilling technique for probably. The, the first like few years of your career if you right. if you want to pursue it um so yeah that that that's the that's the big difference between powerlifting and uh ollie lifting ollie lifting is also used all those movements are also used in like college sports right like football athletes they do cleans because it's all about power that's why power cleans like just like making your body huge man just yeah. uh, in the right in the right spots for each category um and yeah, you can take drugs uh, to enhance. Uh, that's a big part of bodybuilding. Yeah, and it's just all about aesthetics. Not necessarily. You won't necessarily look. You won't necessarily lift that much. But there are a lot of athletes in bodybuilding right. um, who cross over into uh, powerlifting because uh, mm. they're just uh, they're just strong. Yeah. The fourth category actually is strongman, which is uh, yes. Which is just lifting weights, but in any shape or form. Like you, you do Giant stones. Ball, yeah. Right, yeah. You do stones. You do cars. You do trucks. Wow. Um, you do logs. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You can implement parts of uh, powerlifting, implement ollie lifting, and then I guess CrossFit. But that's just, uh, <laughs> just like everything. Yeah. yeah. It's just like everything. Well, that's a really great breakdown. What is kind of like, as you mentioned, right? Form is critical. You mentioned that, you know, you don't drink alcohol anymore. Um, and that's something I also did quit um, at the beginning of my MBA to also quit drinking and focus on fitness. But what is, you know, as much as people talk about, you got to go to the gym to lose weight, you got to go to the gym to get strong. Another equally important half of that is like a diet, what you put in your body. So, you know, what is an optimal diet for you? What is kind of like critical elements of the the outer half of it getting fit and being, you know, into this powerlifting competitiveness. Well, yeah. So traditionally powerlifters have just been like fat old men. Okay. Like fat men who like just have a massive belly and stuff. Um, but uh, there's been a trend uh, in the last few years of like people actually getting like looking jacked and ripped. So, most people get into the sport because they start getting to the gym to lose weight, right? And actually, a lot of people who speak to me, they're always like, oh, how do I lose weight? Um, but the secret to losing weight is, is, is in the kitchen. Like, for sure, is in the kitchen. You have to be super... Well, you have to be kind of strict on your diet. Okay. Um, it's not... I mean, some people are blessed to have um, incredible genetics, I'm not so I'm not super blessed because uh, I've been I've been like chubby or slash fat like most of my life. So um, for me, um, what my diet looks like and is I you can either count your macros and stuff, which 
I don't I don't do so mm -hmm. I just uh, keep it simple and try and I basically eat the same thing every day mm -hmm. um, I eat super clean um, by clean I mean like nothing processed uh, nothing uh, f f deep fried uh, I don't eat anything artificial so no no artificial sugars uh, I don't eat desserts um, for example, my lunch today was like salmon, like salmon in the oven, spinach, tomatoes, onions, sweet corns, peas, um, and some fruit. Uh, so like that's the and that's the kind of food that I'll, I'll eat. Just, just it's just bad on your body in general as well, um, and it's also easier to yeah. You also get a lot of bloating and stuff from uh, eating uh, processed food, so uh, try not to eat out. If I if I eat out with you, it means that I it's respect special, you. It's, special occasion. I, yeah, I did. I think I did it twice last semester because I was uh, last last semester when I was competing. I competed at one sixty five pounds, okay. uh, and I walk around one eighty. So I I spend a whole semester cutting. Wow. Uh, so you compete at 160, that means you have to weigh at 160. Yeah, on the morning, yeah. Oh, on the day off, and I have two hours to get back to whatever weight I want. That's um, a little bit like uh, the boxing or yeah, MMA, bo where it's like they have to cut. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Boxing, boxing, is a bit, boxing and MMA is a bit different because they have 24 hours to weigh in. So they go through much more severe weight cuts. Mm. Uh, so they would, take, um, they would take extra stuff uh, to help them... Uh, poop out yeah. their liquids and stuff, and they will take uh, IVs, liquid IVs, and they would, IV drips to get back to weight. So you, you have stories of people like dropping 30, 40 pounds just That's... just to get down to a weight class. Uh, whereas I think probably the max healthy for for someone like me, we have two hours. We're tested, so we can't take drugs. It's probably around even a max probably for me. It's like. They say like five percent of your body weight would be like max max. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. That, no, that is that is crazy, and obviously maintaining that routine is pretty tough. And I imagine that's even tougher, perhaps, when you're in school, or even when you were you were, were you doing this when you were also kind of working as well. Uh yeah. So when I was working, uh yeah. So when I was working, it was COVID. And I was in Hong Kong. Right. So that was actually, COVID was actually really good for me. Okay. Because pre-COVID, I was like, Hong Kong was amazing. Like We would go out all the time. We'd be drinking, you know. Hong Kong, big up. Best place in the world to live. Represent. No cap. No cap. Best place in the world to live. Low tax. Amazing nights out. Right. Um, you know, you get paid a pretty good. Uh, the food is amazing. Yeah. Uh, nightlife is good. You get hikes everywhere. Every weekend you can fly to Southeast Asia, Japan, Korea, uh, even Australia. We did that once. So you could you could do pretty much anything. Nice beaches. Man, Hong Kong is the best. Hong Visit Kong is Hong the Kong. Best. Hong, yeah. Hong Kong is the best. Um, but during COVID, it was it was kind of it was kind of not that great. Uh, especially we just come off like some protests and uh, China was clamping down and stuff. So. It was a tough time, but it was it was a good it was transformational for me. Mm. Twenty twenty COVID hit. That was when my back finally recovered. Got the green light from all my physios to go back to training properly. Um, and yeah, I just I just committed, and and you there was no eating out, so I had no excuses. That's when I started developing the meal that I'll eat like every day for like five years, basically. Um, just like eating salmon or chicken or steak with some like tomatoes and stuff. Very it's nice. actually pretty good. No, it, it um, sounds very healthy. That's impressive. Uh, but yeah, that was, that was, that was so during my time at Citadel, it wasn't super tough. And then I built a gym in my uh, second bedroom. So I didn't miss any training because all the gyms were closed Ooh, during right. COVID. So that was like two years. So that wasn't too bad. And then uh, during school, nice, nah, easy. Uh, I just cook. Um, obviously I have to work around my school schedule second year you, you might have classes during when you would eat lunch mm. so that's kind of that that kind of that kind, that's 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 cool um, the hardest thing is traveling um, traveling um, and getting your getting the, getting the correct food so when you travel is it's basically impossible 
Um, I usually just, if I'm traveling, I usually let myself um, chill out a bit. If I'm just coming off a competition, if I'm going into competition, then I have to be super strict and it, it's a boring. Yeah. It's basically not even traveling. It's just like being miserable in a new city with no with nothing that you can cook uh, if you're staying in a hotel. So, yeah, no, it's fair. And well, it's obviously paid off. You were the USA powerlifting Massachusetts state champion for your class or your weight. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's. I mean, yeah, that was uh, fall. Right? That was cool. Yeah. Uh, well. Yeah, I was. Uh, I competed in the state championships in November mm-hmm. uh, for Massachusetts. Won my weight class, seventy five, the one sixty five pound weight class. Um, it was, it was cool. I made weight. Um, you know, the US is much more competitive than, uh, say, my home country, Hong Kong, uh, or even the UK. Both my home countries. Um, so that was cool, but um, it was just something nice uh to win but i didn't uh i i'm not still i still consider myself an intermediate lifter uh still got a long way to go in the sport i'm i'm getting pretty a lot of the lifters are like 20 21 22 these days so i'm i'm getting old but let, let's see how how long these bone these old bones can uh, <laughs> carry me forward yeah um, no absolutely yeah. i mean you see i mean even like i know c bum for bodybuilding he's like only 27 and as he's competed and he's won for five straight years and yeah, yeah. all the up and comers are all, you know, 20, you know, ni- 19 to 20 years yeah, old. That's crazy, yeah. uh, you know, um, on the diet piece, you mentioned, right. You're eating chicken, you're eating steak, you're eating salmon, you're eating a good combination of foods. You know, we have this now and now in the modern times, we have this giant push for vegetarianism and veganism. What are your thoughts on that, that you want to say, you know, uh, on kind of like this shift towards a more of a plant heavy diet. And I've, I, I've personally, I've done, I tried to do vegan for about a year and a half during COVID for about like 90% of my meals. And I got very fat, You're I actually very gained fat. weight. Wow. I gained weight. I think okay. I wasn't the healthiest. And then start. I went to China and I eat, I started eating meat. I started working out every single day or five, six times a week. And I cut from like 190 pounds to about 165 at my lowest over the course of a year. Yeah, I mean, uh, I've actually been vegan twice in my life for like a few months at a time. Um, I mean, I don't disagree. Mm -hmm. Um, I just think it's super pointless. Unless you have some, unless you really care about animal health or whatever or i don't know i don't know what you care about but if it's for personal I, I don't know about i don't know about that like if you are eating lab processed fake meat to mm. pretend that you're not eating meat just eat real meat like it's way better for you for sure i, I don't know the, i don't know the size behind it but anything made in a laboratory or anything processed uh especially in america where all the food is like tampered with like it's terrible for you it just can't be good so i i mean if you're if you're like strict vegetarian and you don't eat anything processed you just eat super clean as long as you're getting enough protein right like good on you yeah that's good on you if you but at the end of the day like yeah I, i don't know if you're eating like beyond meat sausages yeah i feel sorry for you Honestly. <laughs> Oof, Honestly, all right. Yeah. No sponsors from Beyond Me, and unfortunately. <laughs> um, okay, that's a fair point. That's a fair point. Well, what's, um, the, what's the? I mean, what's the point? I mean, uh, unless unless you're doing it, unless you really believe in, the, I don't know, like the, the the treatment of these animals. Right. I think personally, for me, it was like personal health. I, that was kind of the argument. There was like a documentary on Netflix yeah, on a Netflix, few years ago, oh, that, Game that Changers. Yeah, um, everyone. But then like, I don't know, there's some evidence afterwards, like it wasn't entirely accurate, right? So... It was all a scam. Oh, okay. Well, I don't know about that. I don't not know fully. It was all a scam, yeah. But, no, but if you, I mean, it's just logically yeah. the difference between meat from a cow or meat that you've made from random materials created by humans right. plus some soya into fake meat. I mean, I, it's, it's probably pretty obvious you don't need a science degree to tell you which one is going to be better for your body totally totally we did i did have a guest earlier who did who did work in the kind of like cellular you know growth industry where they're 
growing meats from cells. So we'll see. Maybe that's a little different than artificial meat, like or fake meat. Yeah, that's probably a bit different. Um, because um, they're just growing the meat without, like, they're growing the actual meat yeah, cells. But that's without, still not that's not veganism. That's not vegan. That's yeah. actually just that's actually just growing vegan. meat without yeah. like them being alive. And yeah. It's like, but the protein piece is definitely the big one. I felt that was a challenge doing a vegan diet, vegetarian yeah, diet. Super hard. You have to eat so much soya, tofu, nuts. Yeah. And man, nuts are so calorific. So right. it's pretty hard. I can imagine. Well, you know, we have we spent a good half an hour on the fitness piece. Uh, I wanted to dive into kind of again your balance between the two, right? You did both. What for the, your full time for your, you know, for the for the job for the career that pays you? Yeah. Um, what how did you find? You know, you know, why did you feel that you know studying natural sciences at the University of Cambridge shifted or translated to a career in finance? yeah um as i'm yeah as i mentioned before it's pretty it's pretty usual in the uk to just study a random degree uh like i had friends study history mm-hmm. uh, who went into investment banking finance so it's pretty normal okay uh, in the uk i know it's not so normal in the us but um as long as you're quantitative um and have or have some interest or you're just smart and you can work out numbers then I think that's what they I think that's what they care about. So yeah, so I did natural sciences and then I yeah, decided to go into trading. I, I actually really enjoyed the interviews for trading. So they were playing some trading games with me, uh, where we were buying and selling. It was like a I remember one of the assessment days, we had like a group of ten people and we were trading we were trading the numbers on some cards, some playing cards. And I remember thinking like these guys are just absolute clowns. Like, what yeah. are they doing? Like, these guys are buying high, selling low. Like, they have no idea what's going on. So that was pretty fun. Uh, yeah, you make you make some fake money, uh, and then and then yeah, and then I got hired, and I was like, okay, well, let me see what it's like, and it was actually pretty fun. So that's 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 that was a story. That was how, that 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 made me excited by it, and that's why I I went into it. And you were in Hong. You mentioned you were you worked in the UK for a year before yeah. you then worked in Hong Kong for five. And that was roughly the time. Was that like roughly when Brexit happened, or like that was still like kind of that yeah, period yeah. Where of transition? Brexit happened uh, just before I started work. So yeah, during my graduation at Cambridge, uh, the Brexit vote happened, uh, and then I started work, and yeah, Brexit happened. I don't. I actually. If your question is going to be how did it affect London, I don't think it's ever affected London. I don't think it affected London at all. London is a terrible place to work, especially when you're starting out. Not a great place to live. High taxes, low pay. People can be, people don't really travel much. Mm. Uh, They get stuck in the UK in a rut. Uh, So I'm not, I'm not the biggest fan of uh, the UK slash London slash Europe in general, because taxes are high. Mm. Um, And you don't, there's not much like innovation opportunity there. So um, I was pretty, I was pretty lucky to get asked to move to the new office in Hong Kong. Um, And well, that was like one of the reasons I chose that company over the other one that I I could have worked for. So I went to Hong Kong and yeah, that that was the, uh, the start of my, started my career in Hong Kong. Absolutely. And, you know, you, before we get into Citadel, you, you know, you, and then this is a more of an industry thing where you work for a firm for however, then you have a non-compete. So you were, you described you were a full-time gardener for a few months uh, between your two two gigs. Yeah. Uh, What was that like? Yeah, that's just a that's just a little joke. Keep my LinkedIn humorous, but uh, yeah, when you when you have a when you switch trading jobs, I, I'm not sure about investment banking, but you have a non compete where you, you sign a non compete when you um, when you join uh, when you join a trading firm. So between my first and second, I had three months non compete. Um, so I wasn't allowed to work for another trading firm for three months. Uh, so that so they call it gardening leave. Uh, maybe in, in the UK, but that's why I called myself a full-time gardener. That that time, I, uh, my first gardening leave, I went to Vegas, uh, lived in Vegas for two months with, with some boys, and 
We played in the World Series of Poker. That was a great time. Two Very months. Nice. Probably, probably one of the most mentally draining two months of my life. Do not play full time poker. It is so <laughs> bad. It's so such a glamorized lifestyle. It's so tough on your head. It's so tough mentally. It's tougher than tougher than trading. Tougher than tougher than training because you sit there all day uh, playing poker. You, you can't move. Like it's 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 hard. And then yeah, so that was three months, and then. I left Citadel in April 2022. I have roughly two years non-compete. So um, that's why I'm back to being a full-time gardener. This time I'm gardening in Harvard Business School. So I guess it's not too bad. Not too bad. Not too not a not bad for a two year uh, two year break. I guess like you know, from three months to two years, what's kind of the industry standard for a non-compete? And a two years seems a long time. Two years is a long time. Um it's usually, I think it's usually around six to, uh, it can be like a short three months, but it can, depends on the size of the firm. Um, six months, probably pre, six right. to months to a year. Six months, pretty standard. Yeah. Citadel is just well known for uh, locking you up. Um, some firms give you lo- longer, so like three years. Wow. Some people get three years, some people get lifetime. Just depends on how important you are, basically. Mm. So the more important, the longer. Yeah, the more money you make for the company, the longer you get locked up. All right. Well, hopefully at least a good severance package of sorts. Uh, and But did you know you were going to go to HBS before you kind of ended and started or... Was it... uh yeah it was it was it was one of the yeah it was one of the options on the table yeah. got it got it um it was definitely definitely one of the options on the table um there are a few other options but yeah this one this one was the one i decided to take yeah now uh can you uh, to the extent that you can speak about what was the experience working at citadel and right that's the firm that ken griffin uh you know started is uh you know pretty big in the industry what was the experience like working in high frequency trading specifically? Yeah. So people usually frequently mix up Citadel, the hedge fund, and Citadel Securities, right. the the prop right. trading firm. All right. So Ken Griffin owns both. Okay. Citadel Hedge Fund is the one which takes institution it takes investor money uh and uh typically trades strategies that um are typical for hedge funds, so like uh startup. Uh, equities, long short, etc. They're usually capital intensive. Um, yeah, returns are, you know, I think last year's returns were like ten percent. Beat the market, very consistent. Citadel is a very good hedge fund. I worked in Citadel Securities, the prop trading side. Um, yeah, King Griffin owns basically all of it. Last, I think last year he's, last year the last year I was there, he sold a stake to Paradigm. Just okay. a crypto VC and uh, Sequoia for for like a chunk for so like at the, like a thirty bill valuation or something. Can't remember. Everyone thought that he was gonna spin it off because he was running for presidency, but mm. we don't know. But securities is, I think, is uh, a much yeah. It's it's like the trading firm which makes generates a huge amount of returns. Like the returns are billions a year. Um, and yeah, that that they they. They're more of the high frequency trading strategies. You get uh, options trading. Um, so I was in uh, volatility options trading futures, um, basically uh, within Asia. Uh, you get uh, equities. Uh, yeah, startup. Uh, yeah, in, no, yeah, index are and equities futures. Mm-hmm. Uh, so all of that generates a, a large number of uh, large amount of money for Citadel Securities. They started doing crypto, but I think they stopped. Uh, and the US, the US, they have a US office, and that's the biggest. They 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 make a lot of money. So they so when so when Citadel were famous for the GME thing, it was Citadel Securities that were involved, and basically they would be market making. Uh, providing liquidity on the exchange for the for retail to basically buy GME. Uh, so yeah, um, obviously they everyone was speculating that they lost a lot of money, but you, know, you buy and you sell. They, they yeah, it was it wasn't too bad. Um, it was a crazy time for sure, and it, eventually it just came all the way back. So I don't think I don't think it was the end of the world for them. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and you were there during that whole kind of 
a host, you know, mania essentially in 2021. Uh, you know, and obviously, I think in your role on your side, you were the institutional player relative yeah. to the retails. What was kind of Netflix just came out with a new uh, mo- document or movie about uh, the whole situation just this last a few weeks. Um, dumb money, I think. What was kind of your thoughts? What was running through your head during kind of that time in 2021? Um, yeah, so that was the US office um, trading that they were right. providing liquidity. We could see their PLs. So it, was, it wasn't. It wasn't like super pretty. Um, there was never a worry that the co- like, it wasn't like the company was going to go down right. or anything. Um, it was actually kind of funny or refreshing to see like how much um, retail could actually affect it. And you know, suddenly everyone was getting interested in trading stocks, trading options, talking about options, even though they had no idea. Right. Um, was, that was kind of funny. And actually, like a lot of my colleagues would actually just be like punting GME in their in their personal account. Obviously, we had approval because you have to get trade approval and stuff. So we were trading meme stocks on our personal level. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, like obviously, yeah, you feel like retail when you're when you're looking at your personal account, and then when you're when you're at work, you're like, damn. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and you, obviously you were kind of separate, right? You were also in Hong Kong at the time. What was the experience living in Hong Kong versus the UK, especially? Um, we talked, you talked about this a little bit earlier, right? It was a really good experience. Hong Kong's really connected to everything. Have you felt, did you feel a change over the last few years that you were there from the start of your five years? Cause that was, as you mentioned, kind of like a time when there was a lot of capital flight, a lot of, uh, talent leaving Hong Kong over the last five years as well. Uh, Yeah. So Hong Kong. Yeah. After, after the protests in 2019, I think a lot of expats got scared. Um, Moved to Singapore. Yeah. They were thinking about it. Then COVID just absolutely sucked. Yeah. Uh, Like you couldn't travel. Basically when you traveled, you had to do quarantine in a hotel locked up. And then at some point they implemented rules where if you went to the UK, US, Australia, Singapore, you'd have to spend two weeks yeah. in a different country before you spend two weeks in a hotel room before you allow. And actually it was three weeks at some point. Wow. So three weeks and three weeks. So um yeah, so that that was that was that was kind of the last straw for a lot of people. Yeah. Um so a lot of expats, yeah, a lot of le- expats left for Singapore. Um, but yeah, uh, it's, I think it's still a great place to live. Mm. Um, industries are still thriving. It's still, uh, the, the, the connection to China for a lot of these companies. And I, I, I go back, obviously my girlfriend's still there. So I go back and, um, it, I don't think too much has changed. Uh, I think, yeah, the expats leaving have, has affected the, the gym and fitness community a bit, but I think I think in time better for the world. No, as, as in there's less clients ah. for people, but uh, yeah, I think uh, yeah, give it some time. I think I think people will realize that it's, it's it's coming back. Yeah. Well, speaking of it, you mentioned this difference um, as an Asian, as an Asian, you know, yeah, you know, you're Asian, UK, yeah, Hong yeah. Kong, uh, you know, what's the f- sense of fitness like within the Asian community or the Hong Kong community? And also even here, right, when you're competing within this powerlifting industry is how is the Asian representation? Yeah, so uh, so that's a good question. So in Hong Kong, when I first arrived, powerlifting wasn't a big sport. Uh, it was super, super niche. Um, couldn't really find anyone mm. doing it, to be honest. Um, but I made a few friends here and there. Now it's like, getting pretty big like you can you can feel you can feel it like we had a, a national championships in august uh last year um i think that, like there were like 100 athletes we they they booked out the um one of the big exhibition centers in kowloon uh and it was like a full event it was pretty it was pretty good uh and yeah fitness is growing especially with some crossfit crossfit gyms blowing up uh and 
and there's a new high rocks thing as well so i think fitness in 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 hong kong is is coming china china's always been good at all of thing but i think they're getting into powerlifting the us is kind of funny like uh at the ground at, at the low level like in the college level a lot of the athletes i've met in boston uh are asian i think it's just a lot of these kids are probably just like do math when they're young or whatever do <laughs> work super hard when they're young and then when they come to college or something they just like start getting to the gym like me and then they just like oh. get into powerlifting because it's like super scientific mm -hmm. you can't you know exactly if you're getting stronger or not okay you know? uh so yeah so you just know you just know you just have some numbers in your head and you like know if you're yeah. stronger so people are attracted by that so i think that's why it's getting big in in the asian circles uh, so uh, yeah there's a lot of asians uh, from, uh doing powerlifting in the us uh not so many actually there are quite a few at the top level but we'll see when we'll see when uh, the genetic freaks come come out to play all right all right we will uh you know you've done this you've done the sport you've worked in hong kong and now you're here why did you end up pursuing like the nba you know two years especially you know nowadays people are like especially if you've worked heavily in that industry in the finance industry you know people are questioning the value of the need to take two years for an mba education you know why why was kind of that the card that you ended up playing essentially yeah so the mba um well firstly i had a two-year break so mm -hmm. kind right. of fit in kind of nicely had a yeah that was that was a that was a thing um secondly the U.S. is still the land of opportunity for sure, and and doing the MBA, learning about some of the opportunities in the U.S. that's that's cemented that thought for sure. So, even though taxes are kind of higher, like Europe, you got to live with it because the opportunity here is crazy, uh, especially for entrepreneurship and mm -hmm. and business, etc. Um, another reason why, yeah, so you do the MBA, you get you, you know you get these you. you you get a visa to stay and work that 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 opens up an option for you um another thing was yeah i just you know i had other things i was doing that didn't work out and, and uh this was this was the option that i ended up going for so uh that's the that's the biggest thing no totally also i could, i wanted to com compete in the, the us uh in power of because there we go because uh, that's this, this is where we would mean this is where the best athletes are, the best coaches, yeah, and the best gyms, and it's just been uh, just been fun, just uh, trying to slow it out and having a dream, chasing a dream, just a kid chasing a dream. There we go. And you mentioned that you you know you traveled a lot while you were in school as well, and you know you have like a little uh, an Instagram account of where to lift in places. So over the last two years of travel, where what you know surprising or not, where has been kind of the best gems for you yeah shout out shout out lift. yeah uh yeah so i well i traveled a lot before school very, i very just had a uh, two years uh two years of covid where we were stuck in hong kong three years two and a half years um but where so, so i started reviewing gyms uh why well, i i've always gone to gyms on on holiday it's just like just kind of fun just to see what they're like um had some pretty funny gym experiences um i remember i remember being in doing yacht week in croatia and taking a um like renting an atv uh renting an atv driving like 45 minutes on some highway in some random island in croatia to get to it what i thought was a gym but was actually a middle school <laughs> uh, and then going into the middle school and getting a deadlift workout in with like literally 12 year olds watching they're like well, what the hell is going on but they had a gym yeah they had a gym they had weights i could deadlift it was crazy uh that was that was pretty funny uh and then i remember in morocco in chef i think it was in might have been in chef Chouin, blue city mm -hmm. um yeah i needed to i think i needed to deadlift and it was like super sweaty didn't have any chalk and I went up to the guy and I was like, I need chalk. And he just like broke off some plaster from the ceiling. <laughs> and I lifted with like plaster from the ceiling. That was, that was kind of wild. Uh, the best gyms, the, 
my most Im- the most impressive gym I've been mm. to, like out of nowhere, was in Nairobi. I do I do like some research before I go to a city. Firstly, like what to eat because I like to try local food. Um, but secondly, like I want to make sure that I can I can find a gym there to train. This gym was kind of like uh, I was on I was on my way to field in Mwanda, mm-hmm. and I was going to I was going to Nairobi. Uh, and the Nairobi, the people in Nairobi field, staying at their their hotel was connected to uh, their gym access was actually in some mall. And then one guy called me when I landed, and he was like, "Oh, this gym is amazing." And I was like, "No way! I found a gym to go to." He was like, "Just come to this one," and I went, and it was like unbelievable. Like unbelievable. The the Kenyan Olympic weightlifting team was training there. It was like wow. It was it was super nice. It was super nice. Brings a smile to my face. That's the, that was the craziest gym I've been to. Um, out of nowhere. Obviously, the nicest gyms I've been to are probably in the US. Right. That's very cool. And you know, you're in EC now. You're in your second year. What do you feel has been the kind of the major difference between your first year at HBS and your second year? Uh, difference between first and second year. Yeah. First year, I think everyone was trying to figure out what was going on. Mm-hmm. Everyone was trying to figure out their life. Everyone was trying to figure out, like, it was all like a bit crazy, you know? And and in the mean, and yeah, I remember first year, you everyone was still like trying to figure out, um, what, like making friends, like trying to figure out their, what they're going to do in the summer. Uh, trying to figure out where to go, and I I, li- I remember competing in September, end of September in my in my in the, in my first year. That was just that was just wild. And then I, I think I competed again in December. It was just a lot of a strain, but that was the biggest difference. Trying to figure out what the hell was going on versus EC year. You pick your you pick your classes. You yeah, you pretty much are more settled in. You like know what you're gonna do. You spend the time doing whatever you want, uh, you prefer or whatever. It's just you, you, yeah, you, you're more comfortable for sure. Um, yeah. Not too comfortable. They like to keep you on the toes of work, but yeah, it's 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 more comfortable for sure. Yeah, that's fair. And speaking of like knowing what you're gonna do, uh, Harvard, and this was in the news in like I think like Financial Times or Wall Street Journal. It's like. The class of 2023, I believe, they released like employment figures and it was like, you know, f- from five years ago of like 95% of HBS MBA graduates have a full time job was in three months after uh, graduation. And now that figure has dropped to like, I think somewhere like around 80% that are, you know, that have and are still are working in a full time job. So that's a significant decline that made some headlines. You know, as somebody who's about to enter the workplace, what are your kind of thoughts on for your class, for the latest class of Harvard MBA graduates? Yeah, so uh, for my for my career in trading, the MBA doesn't really affect it. Uh, so if I was to go back into trading, it wouldn't really it wouldn't really affect my uh, employment. I know it's tough going into traditional jobs that you would out of an MBA like uh, private equity because people are giving less money VC because people are giving less money yeah consulting because there's less money going around IB because there's less deals going around you know that that stuff really affects the market all because of the high interest rates um yeah so you just have to keep on grinding um otherwise you just have to do your own thing entrepreneurship uh but yeah I mean graduated from Harvard Business School like you guys will be fine you know yeah uh so what's kind of next steps for you uh you know in four four and five months from now what's kind of like for your career path what are you hoping to do you know you're going to do this powerlifting you know competition still on the side but you know what's kind of going to be the full-time hustle for you um yeah so uh between options (laughs) yeah well yeah i mean Powerlifting wise, I have a competition soon in uh, Hawaii. Just a local meet. Uh, really like the gym in uh, Hawaii, uh, so I've always wanted to compete there. So I'm, I'm doing that, and then uh, planning to planning to compete again probably around June, July. Um, 
they have they have these like pro card things uh that's like my dream that's like my current dream so we'll see i don't think it's probably a bit of a reach to get one this year but uh maybe we'll see in the in the next year uh yeah work wise uh yeah me and my me and my uh business partner joe uh who dropped out last year dropped out of hbs yeah dropped out of hbs last year we're uh we're um we're in the process of uh buying some med spas so like we're rolling out med spas in the east coast uh so we bought one in charlotte um bought one in charleston bought big one in charleston closing two right now in pensacola and new york so for now uh that's probably that's probably the the the, the hustle is probably consuming most of my life right now okay it's actually not it's not not super easy uh to do to do that stuff i th- i thought it was but it's not um so yeah so that's so that's what me and my uh yeah, me and my business partner uh are working on right now sort of like uh it's like the whole search fund thing it's like a eta you're buying existing businesses in that kind of space yeah, yeah, yeah. so it's kind of like eta yeah it's like uh well, eta entrepreneurship through acquisition buying companies um yeah that's that's the that, that's the plan um except we're not just buying one we're buying multiple right uh, hopefully and package them up uh, into a platform are you doing a singular brand for them or are they remaining their own individual uh, brands? right now they're remaining uh, separate brands um we might build some de novos under the and some new locations under the existing brands but right, uh, right now they're 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 under their uh, old brands uh, we go in you know we improve them operationally right uh, and we just buy some more uh, reach some economies of scale and, and see what we can do from there I know some of the biggest challenges, at least with the med spa space, is that you need to have a doctor, yeah. a part of the med spa. So when you acquire these businesses and you own most of the equity, what is kind of the incentive to retain that doctor? You know, Yeah, so usually the doctors are the, f- the owners of these practices before. Right. Uh, so we just roll over some equity when we buy the company and they retain some equity. Mm-hmm. Uh, so they're incentivized to still carry on working. If if we need doctors, some states, some states you just need a doctor to sign off. Um, but yeah, some states you need a doctor there. So it just depends. Um, but yeah, we're just working through it. And yeah, they roll over equity. We keep them incentivized. They still get paid if they're working. So it's pretty good. That's fair. And so you're doing some in New York. Is that the most northeast that you're? The, is there any in Boston or? Is, any further north or uh, we're, we're looking we're looking everywhere for sure like right we had a test uh, we had a pilot in um, Boston but we'll look anywhere uh, we might we might look a bit further west uh, as well um, but yeah we're, we're, we're looking if you know any med spas uh, yeah hit, hit me up there we go hit Jimmy up uh, no it's a, it's a very interesting space and I think a little bit different from high frequency trading so new challenge yes yeah, yeah, it's different. It's different. Um, yeah. yeah, high frequency trading is just like super, super sci- like scientific, basically. You just like sit at your desk all day and you just like run some numbers and you make money and then that's it, really. Um, yeah, this is, yeah, getting into a company and, and seeing how it's run and pulling your hair out at the inefficiency and inability of some things and stuff is kind of wild. Uh, but. Yeah. It's a different experience, uh, but it's uh, it's definitely rewarding for sure. Absolutely. So, well, we've you know had you for nearly an hour. So, I want to thank you, Jimmy, for your time. And maybe when you're an alum, maybe in a few years, I might have you back and interview you as a successful med spa, you know, enterprise owner, or yeah, you sell it to a private equity <laughs> or a pension fund, or yeah, however that happens. We'll see. We'll see how that goes. Perfect. Well, thank you very much, man. Thank you. Take it easy. Thank you.